Do you need more traffic to your website? Sure, we all do. So what are the ways that we can generate more traffic? We could optimize our website for the search engines known as SEO. That might take weeks, could take months for that to happen. You can buy traffic. You can buy Facebook ads, Google ads. Those can be pretty expensive, but did you know there's another way that you can actually get instant traffic? And that is through purchasing or renting other people's lists or other companies' lists. And today on the show, we have an expert who does exactly that. Today, I'd like to introduce e-commerce expert and traffic master, Chad Hamsey, on this episode of Bootstrap MD. Hey guys, this is Dr. Mike Wu Meng. Welcome to another edition of Bootstrap MD, the podcast for physician and healthcare entrepreneurs. I know a lot of you have had questions about how to get more traffic to my website, whether it's, you know, you're a coach and you want to get more prospects to be turned into clients, or maybe you have your own practice right now and you don't know how to get through all of the noise in terms of SEO and social media, and maybe you want to attract more patients. Well, I found an expert and he gladly has accepted to be on this. It's someone that I just met recently at a business conference, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. If you're looking for traffic, then don't go away. You'll definitely want to pay attention to this interview. Uh, this gentleman was a former professional MMA fighter who started his entrepreneurial journey as an online affiliate marketer and media buyer back in 2009. Since that first time, he's founded seven and eight-figure startups, as well as scaled several client offers. And these endeavors have generated over $150 million in revenue and over $1 billion, that's billion with a B, visits online. He currently operates his own e-commerce brands, as well as his agency, which is known as DSV2 Media. Please welcome to the program, (laughs) not not doctor, but Chad Hamsey. Chad, how are you doing? Great, man. How are you doing? Happy to be here. I'm used to interviewing a lot of doctors. (laughs) Maybe (laughs) maybe that's next for me. Yeah, it it could be. It could be. You know, you've done so much tremendous things in your life. And I I don't want to keep you busy because I know you're an MMA fighter and you can, I'm sure you can kick my butt. So I'm going to make sure I respect your time. (laughs) But, uh, you know, we met, uh, you know, in person uh, just a few months ago, we were at a uh, crypto business conference of, of all things. Yeah. But I've heard your name uh, for quite a while in this internet marketing, internet business, a world that we we live in. And I dip my toes in every now and then. Mm-hmm. But I want to hear your story because it's very interesting. Uh, I, you know, I've read about about you and listened to you on some podcasts, but I think our viewers would definitely want to know more about how you got started because it, I think it's very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty interesting. Um, I uh, I used to be a business analyst. I lived in Canada, um, you know, since I was born for the most part, um, and I was a business analyst from about two thousand five to two thousand nine. And you know, I was fighting and training all that time, and that's really what I wanted to do uh, with my life, <laughs> that sort of stuff. And you know, I spoke with my wife, and you know, I was like, you know, where can we go? Where it's affordable, we'd be able to train full time, so we didn't have to really work and you know, that basically took off a lot of spots on the list in the world, but um, it allowed us to go to Thailand. So we went to Thailand uh, pretty, you know, we were pretty broke at the time and all that. We had a bit of money saved up to do this trip. And so, you know, fighting, training full time for a year was great. Uh, near the end of the uh, trip um, or well, about a year into it, um, my dad got sick. He had stomach cancer. And so um, I had to move back to Canada essentially uh, to take care of him help take care of them. And so, you know, I just had a year of like freedom, right? So the last thing I wanted to do was work. And plus I needed to kind of be around the house. So I literally just typed in, you know, how to make money online. It was basically how I did it. And you can imagine just the rabbit hole of like, you know, deception that I went down yeah. Google. Yeah, I'm sure the first listing was t- completely legitimate, right? <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Well, back then, less compliance on Google. So the first 10 or so are probably not very legitimate. And uh, so a lot of it was just like, you know, reading, studying. Um, I was in forums. I joined a forum called PPC Coach, which I learned pay-per-click marketing. 
Um, so that was good. I came across that and um, a lot of good affiliates actually came out of that forum way back in the day. So, uh, and then I just started testing. Um, I was already in debt. So I figured I might as well just put more debt on my credit card to just <laughs> test ads. Yeah. It was the worst business plan ever, but um, yeah. And then I had a, you know, I had my first six figure month about four months into it. And um, I was like gross revenue, right? Not profit. And so I was like, wow, this is, there's something to this. And so um, I just kept going, kept testing and all that. And, um, you know, kind of the rest is history. I've had different startups along the way, um, you know, some massive successes, some not so much, but that's kind of the game, right? And so, um, yeah, it's, it's been great. And um, it's allowed me to kind of live the lifestyle that I like, you know, freedom and all that. So I'll get the train still every day. So <laughs> that's important to me. This podcast episode is sponsored by Yield Nodes. If you're looking to get into cryptocurrency, but you're scared away by all the volatility, first, I don't blame you. Recently, I discovered a passive income opportunity, which is known as Yield Nodes, which is a profit sharing program where they are investing in creating nodes, creating servers that can help the blockchain. My returns average about 8 to 10% per month. I'm not a financial advisor. You should do what you feel is important for your money. But if you want to check this out, go to bootstrapmd.com slash go slash yield nodes. And I think you'll be really excited about the opportunities that are possible through cryptocurrency. But but was it, I mean, it, it's definitely inspiring. And I, I, I talk to clients and, and people who want to start their own business. And, you know, I see some who just like, okay, I'll kind of do it on the side. And then they never get anything done. And, and what I, mm-hmm. I tell folks is like, if you really want to have a business, like, hire people and then be responsible for their payroll. And, 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 and even if yourself, you know, you said you're broke, so, you know, you, you had to make it work. And so yeah. putting it on credit cards is, you know, it's like rolling a dice, but if I wanted to get this accomplished, you know, I need to do this. I mean, how much of a motivation was that for you to make sure your business was as successful as it could be? Oh, I mean, it was, uh, you know, my wife was pregnant at the time. So, you know, I had a baby on the way. I had a mortgage. My dad was sick. So there was a lot of things that were stacked where I'm like, I have to make this work because my wife was working. And so, you know, I knew that she's going to have to start, stop working soon. And it, I didn't feel it was fair on her. And so I just had to, you know, it was it was essential that I made it work. Like I just didn't really have many of much of an option. So I was working, you know, 14 to 16 hour days uh, in the beginning, just trying to learn it uh, mostly on my own. I never really had, you know, mentors, especially back then, other than just being in the forum and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it was hundred percent essential. Um, you know what I tell people, like if they're working a full-time job and that sort of thing, uh, one thing I often tell them is, you know, your full-time job is from, let's say nine to five, uh, if you don't have the, you know, the capital or whatever to hire people, then your second job, which is your business is going to be from like six to midnight or whatever it is, just the way it is. Now, if you're coming with some capital and you said it best, like you just have to learn the, op- the operational aspects and learn how to audit. So learn what's good, what's bad, and then hire people to actually do that legwork during the day. That's the best scenario. If somebody's, you know, got some cash, they got a, you know, business or a job, but they want to transition out. That's usually the best scenario because it gives you the end goal that most of us want anyway, which is just being working on the business instead of inside of it. Right. So I always ended up started working inside of it. So even to this day, it's a, it's a tricky thing where if I think I can just get something done faster myself, I'll do it because I have those skills and that's, not really what we want to do, you know, long term when we're trying to break free of working, right? So, yeah, but yeah, but but sometimes you have to. I, and you know, it's funny because you know, I have a I have a practice up here. We're, we're both from San Diego. I'm in North County, San Diego. He's in that uh, I think that that ghetto known as La Jolla. But yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty rough these days. Right? Pretty pretty it's, pretty it's, rough. Yeah, for sure. But um, yeah. So while you know, I talk to when my my nurses and say, oh, we haven't seen you in a while. You know, you know, you're hardly seeing. You know, you're hardly seeing patients. You're hardly, and, and it should imply that I'm hardly working. I can say, you know, I'm always working. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I'm always working. So 100%. even as even as entrepreneurs, we're, we're still hustling when we're still making things work. So yeah. let's fast forward to now to today. You've got so many different businesses. To, to, well, what what's occupying your time now? Tell us about your business and and, and all the all the different things that you're doing. 
entrepreneur wise? Yeah, for sure. So um, right now I have, you know, only two main businesses, which is actually, you know, less for me, um, you know, historically, but I'm now considering like launching an FT and doing all this other stuff. That okay. We've, uh, <laughs> we've talked about, so I don't want to get in trouble there, but um, you know, I, I do have a, uh, a car care brand. Uh, it, it's e-commerce. It's called the last coat. Um, we started it in 2018. It's been one of the fastest growing uh, car care brands out there. So that's been pretty cool. It's been fun. Um, and then I still have my, uh, my agency, uh, which is kind of like an affiliate business. Um, you know, we're, we're just, we just have big email lists and I can talk about what we did for that later, but, um, we, we essentially take on either clients who kind of rent our lists out, that sort of thing, or, uh, we'll send, you know, traffic as an affiliate. So we'll just get a commission basically, uh, you know, on, you know, whatever product we're promoting. Um, we also in that business do what's called identity resolution. So essentially we kind of place a pixel on somebody's website and then we can kind of match 30% of those visitors to a valid email address, uh, even if they don't opt in or anything. So we can actually generate email emails from people who just come visit a website, which is pretty cool. So we usually get about 30% of those, um, you know, and, you know, if somebody's getting a hundred thousand visits to their site, we can get about 30,000 a month, you know, in terms of leads. So that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, we do a lot of lead gen and all that sort of stuff as well. So um, we build just these giant lists, typically with like uh, polls or a survey type strategy. People like taking quizzes and all that stuff. And then and from there, we're able to build those lists up pretty affordably. Now, I got started in my internet business journey by um, actually buying a list. Mm -hmm. uh, back then I spent, you know, it was a, it was a big, you know, uh, a big step, a big step to take. Um, where I bought a list, it was an internet marketing list from a mm -hmm. guru who's actually my mentor. And he, I bought it. Uh, well, I don't want to give how much I actually bought it for, but I've made, you know, a hundred times over uh, that, that, that I paid for it. So how did you get started with lists? Did you buy them? Did you build them from scratch? How did you get started? Yeah. So um, I have this whole thesis when I'm, when I'm building emails, right? So if I'm just building uh, an email list for the purpose of sending out emails, like not so much to, like to build a buyer's list. Um, I want people who are clicking well, like just who are going to click from emails. And so we would go and do media buying, which is basically we're going to buy traffic, but we do it off of other email lists. Mm. So we wouldn't own the list, kind of like what people do with us. Essentially, they you know pay us a flat rate. We send an email out for them. So we went and did that on other people's lists. That's how we actually started it. And we used to just advertise as affiliates trying to make profit on day one. And then, um, you know, performance was trending down like that and that sort of thing. So I was like, you know, what's a way that we can kind of own the asset a little bit more. And so we started, you know, getting people to subscribe on like hot topic kind of polls and that sort of stuff and surveys. And so that was how we ended up building the list over time. So it's essentially like running ads, just we would run the ads on people's email lists because I wanted you know, subscribers who are used to clicking emails at the end of the day. Uh, and the reason for that in our business is we're not selling a product in that business. Uh, we'll promote offers, but we monetize a lot by sending out just like uh, articles and news and that sort of stuff. It's like AdSense sort of on steroids. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of how we do it. But um, so that's how we started list building. Um, you know, obviously in the automotive business, the list is our buyers, right? You know, we're just generating buyers. So so let's talk about that because that's a subject that we really haven't talked a lot about. And that is like buying lists. Yeah. So I have some, um, I have sometimes had businesses coming to me and say, Hey, I want to get in front of doctors yeah. or, and what's the best way to do it? You know, I get this one who says, Hey, I, I found this list on eBay of this list of doctors that I can yeah. get. <laughs> that's probably not the best way to get it. What, what would you recommend? You know, if you're wanting to go send out a promotion on somebody else's list, the if it's a if it's a like kind of a niche like doctors and that sort of thing, honestly, the, the way people are approaching you about it, um, that's the that's the easiest way, just kind of reaching out and seeing, hey, what, what would it cost to you know do a dropout? Now, a lot of times, unless the person that you're asking does this thing regularly, they don't really know how how to price it. So I can kind of speak to that a bit. So the way that we buy our traffic, there's a couple of different ways um, when we're buying off emails. The first one is just a normal CPC, like a cost per click. All right. This usually takes, this is going to sound funny. It either takes a really savvy person on the other end to agree to that or someone who's not very experienced at all. And the, and the reason being is because 
buying on a CPC doesn't guarantee them any money. So they're going to be sending the list, but unless they really know the promotion and that sort of thing, they might just agree to it. You might say, Hey, I'll, I'll pay a dollar per click to a lot of people. They're like, Oh man, that's awesome. Right. But they don't necessarily, they could actually get more if they, if they rented the list out to you on a CPM. So CPM is the way we normally buy. And basically all that means for every thousand emails that are sent. So let's say somebody has a list of a hundred thousand emails or, or 10,000 emails, we'll pay a, a fixed fee per every thousand emails sent. It's pretty easy for them to see. They'll tell you, yeah, my list is 50,000. Okay. So at a $1 CPM, you know, 50, it's 50 bucks for the drop, right? Now, what's a fair CPM? I mean, they'll usually give you that rate if they're used to buying on that. Um, for us, we typically buy at five to eight dollars. But really, that's just a negotiating thing, right? Like if the person doesn't have a price and you just want to be like, all right, I'll send you, I'll pay you a dollar CPM. <laughs> like they might say yes to it because nobody really mails their list, right? Um, so those are the those are the two main ways that we buy. They're pretty straightforward. Um, and then the other way to buy is just on a kind of like an affiliate structure. So they might they might mail whatever you want to send out as just an affiliate. I tend not to like that because their motivation, especially if they they have a good list that they do send stuff to, it's it's kind of minimal because they're probably already renting the list out on a, a CPC or a CPM, right? So most good list owners um, who, who have done this before, they want that guaranteed money. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really just reaching out like somebody like yourself, you have a list, there's other people that might have lists. They don't really have to be big. If the size of your service, like, you know, let's say we're talking doctors and medical services and all that, really, I mean, you don't need a ton of volume there, right? You just right. need to have that endorse, that implied endorsement, which I like to call it. And um, really doesn't take a lot of patience to make you know money on that uh, on that drop for sure that email drop. As a doctor, I wasn't used to asking for help, especially when it came to subjects outside of medicine. But then I found PhysicianCoaches.com. In an instant, I found hundreds of experts to help me in all aspects of life, on areas I was afraid to ask, dealing with burnout starting a side gig, money management, even help with my marriage. And the best part? Nearly all experts are physicians themselves. After reading their profile and a quick chat, I knew I found the right mentor for me. At physiciancoaches.com, help from professional colleagues is just a click away. What are some questions that, you know, first starting out, because I've, I've rented lists, you know, and, and such. And like I said, I've had some who are like super savvy. Mm -hmm. And then I've heard, had some who are like, you know what, I'll get back to you because yeah. they haven't figured, no one's ever asked them that before and yeah. they don't really know how to price it. What are some things that you can recommend, like what we should be asking to make sure we're getting value in what we're doing? For sure. The first one would be how frequent do they email their list? Um, that that's number one for us. Typically, um, a lot of the people that we buy off of, uh, they're emailing their list at least daily and sometimes two to three times a day. Like for us, for example, we, we mail three times a day. Now it's a little bit different because we send news out, right? News we can send twice a day. It's trending news and then we'll send one promotion. Um, but I like to see at least, you know, three times a week, if we're talking about professional services and that sort of thing, a lot of people are hesitant to do that because they feel that they're going to burn their list out. Um, in the consulting space, the coaching space, uh, the advising type of market, um, most people will be, they'll love to hear from someone if you're actually, if they're actually giving value to them. So that's the next thing we look at is like, okay, you're mailing, you know, once a week, maybe, which isn't a lot, but what kind of stuff are you typically sending out? If they're always sending out just like a promotion, not even a sale, just like a it doesn't really make much sense. Just like, Hey, we do this service, blah, 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 blah. So that's not going to be as responsive. Right. And then the third thing, which, I mean, this is, this is a really easy way to just kind of circumvent a lot of this is just asking for the stats. Um, now, even if they're not that experienced of a, of a sender, they should be able to tell you, Oh yeah, our average over the last 30 days is X, you know, open rate X click rate. Um, now, for some up-to-date kind of info, the Apple iOS 15 type updates have kind of right. skewed open rates a little bit. So for, for sure. the most part, we look at clicks and essentially the simplest answer is how many clicks on average do you send 
uh, to whatever link you're sending uh, when you when you send an email. That's like the simplest question that you can you can have answered, and it tells you that okay, I'll have X number of people. I mean, you can start getting into all those other ones like oh, okay, well, you know what what kind of uh, opt in rates do you get on other people's lists? So, but if somebody's not that experienced, they're not going to know that. But they can tell you, um, you know, I have I, I can usually generate a hundred clicks. Okay, great. And then that comes down to your funnel, you know, whomever, wherever you're sending that traffic to kind of grab those people and do that, you know, do the conversion process, right? I'm sure you don't do this as much, but I can imagine like when you first started out, were you like trying to get on their list just to make sure to see what are kind of offers that, that they have, you know, was it, was their email getting into your, was it going into spam or was it, you know, on the list? Like, do you do like some spy work before you go in there? We still do it. We do that all the time. Yeah. Um, not just myself. There's probably two to three of us internally that we do what's called seeding. And we're basically hmm. seeding our emails. We're putting our emails onto their list. And a lot of times the list brokers, uh, or not even list brokers, the list owners that we go to, they'll tell us, okay, you opt in here. Or we'll just tell them, can you seed my list? Because I want to see what's being sent out. That's totally reasonable. Um, you know, if somebody's not really aware of this whole, whole thing, then I would just opt in on their list to kind yeah. of prove everything out. And it just becomes a thing where you're building up over time, uh, a portfolio of lists that you can, you can hit and you can advertise on. Right. So, um, you know, put, get a throwaway type email address, one that's just for tracking this sort of thing. That's what we do. And, um, just start opting into lists that might be a good fit for, you know, the product or service, you know, that, that you're doing. Right. Um, it's been so long since I've, I've examined list buying, but I remember there was a resource that had like a list of all these different associations and emails. Is there still one that's currently they have today? I remember I remember going to the library to get this. I, I can't remember what yeah. it was called, but there was like a list of uh, resources or is it, or is, is a lot of that stuff kind of outdated and, and it's not needed? Well, um, you know, there is, there is some B2B kind of, uh, like generating leads in the B2B space, right? Which is a whole, I mean, we could have a whole more complex talk about that. Um, one of them is called Apollo, Apollo.io. It's pretty cheap. So that's like, let's say you want to find um, doctors or a specific segment of people. You can actually find all those leads and just get all their contact info. In terms of, um, in terms of the, those types of, you know, uh, I guess, um, like, listings and that sort of thing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, typically you just want to like simple Google searches of like, um, easy listing, like your niche and then easy listing. That's cause that's what they tend to call them. It's called easy. Right. Oh yeah. Um, really? Yeah. Like magazines, easy. so yeah, I've heard, uh, heard that term in like 20 years. They still use yeah, them. Exactly. So they still call them that. And, um, you know, you can do the same with, you know, niche newsletter listings, that sort of stuff. But often it comes down to, uh, like finding the bit, like the newsletters in your space, like the researchers, knowing your competitive uh, intel, your competitive landscape, that sort of stuff. And that's kind of something every, every, you know, business owner should kind of know, but um, you can get away in certain markets with just looking for easy and a newsletter listings. And then, um, then it comes down to those guys that are usually listed on those types of sites, they'll have the stats for you and that hmm. sort of thing. So those are the ones where you can ask them the questions and fire the questions at them. And, on. and I assume to a point, everything is somewhat negotiable. Correct. Yeah. Especially. And so that's, you know, that's why we like the email stuff is because just everything's negotiable, right? You know, there's certain things that you can do where you can just ask for more traffic and it happens to us too. So let's say, you know, a drop goes out, it doesn't work that great for a client. Maybe their offer was off, who knows, you know, we had deliverability issues is rare, but um, they'll just be like, Hey, can I get to make good on that drop? So that means we'll just give them another drop, right? We'll include it. So they get some more traffic. So there's all sorts of things you can negotiate. Um, we like to, uh, we like to, you know, negotiate make goods for sure. Um, we like to not, you know, the type of traffic that we buy, sometimes they want to charge you a premium if you're sending the traffic to a lead, a lead capture page or an opt-in page. They what, just want to what charge make goods for audits. What, what is that exactly? Oh, sorry. So, um, if you get a make good, it's basically, so let's say the email you sent, you had sent out, it didn't do that well for you, right? You didn't get many opt-ins. Um, a make good is just them sending another one for you for free. You want to make good. Yeah, make exactly. Sense. You want to make good. We call them make betters, but yeah, they're, they're typically called make, make better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're typically called make goods. And um, yeah, it's a pretty simple thing. It's kind of, you know, uh, accepted out there. Uh, again, somebody with a, a, a list that they don't send to very often, they might find that a bit weird, right? Type of thing. But again, that same person probably doesn't know how much their list 
is worth. So you could probably get a cheaper rate anyway, <laughs> anyway right? So the email world is very, very negotiable. Like that's what so I like a lot about it. So let's talk about, uh, you switch gears and let's talk about the offers. So you do offers, you have your own offers, and then you also have offers from your clients, right? Mm-hmm. And do you do you work on their offers for them or is they, or they've already kind of tested it or you kind of tweak it to what you think is going to fit well and, and get the best conversion rate as possible? Yeah. So typically if, um, you know, the clients that we would take on for media buying traditionally, um, they have a, an offer that's converting well, like they're already spending maybe 30, 50,000 a month. And then they're coming to us for us to scale it out. Now, if somebody's not quite at that, at that level, um, we'll usually like, yeah, like on a consultative basis, we'll look at their offer, like where they're sending the traffic and, um, and we can start, yeah, we start tweaking it. Cause we kind of just know like the psychology, the layouts, all that sort of stuff. Typically when somebody hasn't really gone start or just not getting much traction, it's almost always because of the offer, right? Because if you have, um, if you have an offer that's pulling well and that sort of thing, especially if it's got a good back end, there's traffic all over the place. Right. That's usually not the problem. There's usually a disconnect between the messaging of what they're saying in the ad or the you know email ad or Facebook ad or whatever, and then what the person's actually seeing on the, on the site. And that's you know bridging that gap. Like you know we've been in the game for a really long time, so it makes sense to us. Like you can just kind of see it right away. But a lot of people can't really just see that. It takes them a long time to um, a long time to kind of learn that bridging that gap. But that's the biggest thing that we do because. I'm very front end centric um, because just through my years of being an affiliate, I'm really trying to get the front end of stuff to convert very, very well um, to get that earnings per click higher. Right now, a lot of people in coaching, that sort of thing, they often skip that phase because the back end, like what they're selling on the back end, is worth so much that they can be sloppy on the front end. Right. But when you combine the two, that's how you scale to like, multi eight figures and that sort of thing, uh, you know, assuming your niche can sustain that. Right. But, uh, but yeah, so that's usually what we do when people come to us, we'll just kind of like, I can really look at it and that's usually done on a consultative type basis, right. Like retainer type deal. But, um, but it often works really well, especially if they're not having a lot of traction, that sort of thing. If somebody comes to us with, sorry, if somebody came to us with a really proven offer, yeah. usually if I do any improvements there, it's improvement in the model itself. Like I'll go through the whole, thing. And there's probably monetization points. Um, well, it could be like selling their leads, doing certain types of things that are in the funnel that they're not seeing. Um, especially if it's like a coaching type thing, because again, those people might be spending a lot just because their backend can sustain a lot of ad spend. So most people can see improvements. Um, those starting out obviously can see more. So yeah. So message to market match definitely sounds like it's, it's number one. What are some other areas where you see a lot of mistakes maybe newbies or maybe more experienced people have done on their, their landing page uh, that, sure. that you can uh, teach us. For sure. So for, um, for newbies, for beginners, uh, number one is not building it for mobile. Um, mm. It may look fine on mobile, but I mean, not taking a mobile first type approach, right? Um, not taking a mobile optimized approach because the majority of traffic now is mobile. Right. So a lot of people, they'll judge the way that their site looks and functions and that sort of thing based on how it looks on desktop. Right. Especially beginners. And um, it's very interesting because like, but not a lot of people think that most of the traffic is on mobile, even though we're using our phones all day. Right. (laughs) You know, it's right. right, But but it definitely is. Most traffic is mobile. I know for us, 60 to 70 percent of our e-commerce traffic is mobile. Right. On even on email, people, people opening their emails and clicking. It's mostly mobile right now as well. So that's where the priority has to be. And then um, after that, the the conversion optimization, um, the conversion process has to sustain that. So you'll, you'll have, depending on what somebody's, you know, selling it, you know, this could be a whole few podcasts ourselves, but um, basically if we're just doing strict lead generation, right. And there, there doesn't have to be much of a pre-sale or anything like that. Often having the form above the fold on a phone, on a mobile tablet. So right when you get there, there's like a headline that's, you know, it's a market, you know, match and then goes right into a, right into the form. So somebody can start filling out boom, 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 pretty easily. As they scroll down, there's more supportive statements and proof, evidence, all that sort of stuff. And then either a button to go back to the form or another form at the bottom. Sometimes I'll just do two forms, right? Hmm. So the, um, on desktop, I would just say, have people look into, uh, it's called the, the F layout, F conversion layout. It basically, we kind of, uh, 
we, our eyes track on desktop uh, from left to right type of thing, and then and then downwards. So essentially, the forms you have on the right headline hero shot, which is basically the end result somebody wants, and then done. Uh, in the coaching consulting space, you tend to have a pre-sale video, right? Because that, that you're trying to get somebody on the phone, you're trying to close them, all that sort of stuff. So typically, headline that addresses the market, the pain points, all that, and then the video is right there. And that video is what's doing the selling, typically. Um, but the sale, this is where I see a lot of people tripped up, even more experienced people. When they're trying to get somebody on the phone, they're trying to, they often try to sell their product to a degree inside of that video. And that's not the way I go around it. It, it. it sounds counterintuitive, but what you're trying to sell is the idea of a system or solution or whatever it is, but you're trying to sell getting them on the phone. Like the whole idea is to get curious, to learn more about it and to get them on the phone. Because the phone is where in that scenario where the sale is going to happen. We have too many people who just start to bring up all this other stuff in the video and then the person has objections. It shouldn't be anything like that. It should just be like laying it out how this is an improvement over what the traditional way has been done. And then it goes, it goes to the call, right? That Typically a book a call type video shouldn't be more than 10 minutes. You might see them up to 20 minutes. Um, really? I've, I've seen one up to 30, uh, believe it or not. Um, but it was pretty engaging and it was like a lesson yeah. and that sort of thing. And then it was just like going into the book a call, right? So. Yeah, that's, that's great stuff. I mean, there's so much we, we can talk about it. Sure. So yeah. I think, so is it, can we say exclusively now video beats non-video or is there always exceptions? There's exceptions. So, you know, in the high volume type of like uh, nutritional, when I say nutritional, I mean like supplements and this sort of stuff, the highest, a lot of the highest volume offers I see are, they don't have a, they don't have a video. It's just a page, kind of like with the layout I talked about um, on desktop, it's like the form. And then there's a, on the second page is a checkout process, but those are typically pre-sold. There's like an advertorial. So like a pre-sell article that, that kind of addresses pain points or it's from a testimonial type uh, angle or whatever. And then that goes to the, the, the product page, the offer page. Um, but I also do see a lot in the supplement space with video. In the coaching consulting type space, yes, from what I've seen, video for sure. Uh, and a lot of that is because there's a guru, so to speak. There's a face there. And you kind of need that, that face. You need that someone talking, you know, who are they? What have they done? What's the evidence? Their proof? What are, what are they bringing to the table that's new? So, yeah, in those types of cases, for sure, I would say video. And are you seeing these videos? Are they pretty elaborate, like with expensive sets? Or is it just a no. simple talking head? Now, for, for especially in the consulting coaching space, it's oftentimes just somebody presenting on a whiteboard, just kind of talking on a whiteboard because delivering what appears to be, you know, semi-instruction, but not giving all the details out to what this new system or that sort of thing can be. Uh, we're seeing a lot of like really creative type funnels, like where people are sending traffic to like a Facebook instant message or an SMS type funnel. Uh, it's a little more advanced. Uh, it's a little trickier to pull off if you haven't done it before. Um, we see some guys sending people just to a Google Doc, really. Like it's really? pretty. It's, yeah, it just it just depends how warm that audience is. Um, and in that scenario, you got to have a really strong offer, right? Getting somebody on the phone, especially when you're testing your offer out. The reason I like it, if it's a higher ticket thing or it's a coaching thing or whatever else, the reason I like the phone is because. If you don't have your pricing nailed down and your offer nailed down fully, you can change all that and test that very easily because it's not in a video, right? It's not on the landing page and now I got to go change this video. Now I got to go test five. No, the video is just to get them on the phone, right? So when you have them on the phone, you can test all sorts of pricing. You can test offer structures, bundling, all that sort of stuff from one call to the next. And you can see what resonates best. Now, are they... Um... Are they asking for money at the beginning, like a tripwire, like we do often in, in you know, e-commerce, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stuff like a small product or a book, you know, your free plus shipping offer, or is it just straight to the phone? What have you been seeing? I've been seeing both um, quite a bit, actually. Uh, the one that's been, I don't want to say scaling out, but the one that's been a little bit easier for people uh, in the last few years to get mm -hmm. to that profitability point has just been getting them on the phone. Right. Mm. And I think it's because mainly, especially for beginners, it's just less moving parts, right? You really, what, what is the page? You have an ad, wherever it's running, goes to a page with a video on it, gets them on the phone, and then that's it. Right. 
Um, the next one that I've seen um, that tends to work well is kind of like, like you say, like it's free plus shipping. But in this case, you know, don't really, don't really need shipping. It's just a cheap book, right? It's like a book that's like usually a seven to ten dollars that can change based on the niche, right? Sometimes it'll go to thirty dollars for investing, but it's a cheap book that basically talks about the what, but not necessarily the how of a certain strategy. It may be a little bit, it gives some, it gives some, it gives value. The person's like, yeah, I want to learn more from this person. And then it, it has like, kind of like calls to action to get on a call to learn more throughout that book. So the book is not quite a sales letter, but it's not far off from one as well. Right. So, and then from there, that sort of thing allows you to, you know, recoup some ad costs right away. You can also put them through that traditional funnel. Maybe you have a, like a course that you made a long time ago that can kind of fit in as a quick upsell but everything in that funnel is meant to take people to the higher ticket, the call eventually, right? Now, I was recently at a business, uh, kind of a mastermind, and they've they've said quizzes have been a lot of, they've had really high conversions introducing a quiz. Have you yeah. seen the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, a lot of our lists have been built off of uh, surveys, polls, quizzes, right? That's That's typically how we've done it for a few years. Um, in our market, it's a little bit different, but quizzes can, we've done it in health, we've done it in like political type spaces, financial spaces. Absolutely. There's been too much talk like in the past 10 years of like uh, removing resistance, uh, sorry, removing friction from a sales process, right? Everyone's like, um, oh no, make it frictionless, frictionless. Well, if that was the case, I would just send somebody right to a product page every time and just expect them <laughs> to buy. It doesn't really work unless that ad that you're sending them from is just gangbusters and works well. So often, especially in consulting, coaching, that sort of stuff, having somebody go through a quiz type process is, is really, really smart because for one, it pre-qualifies the lead that's going to come through to you. The, the person might just not qualify for what you have. And secondly, it, it has the prospect thinking that the solution that you're coming to is customized. We've, we've done things in the health space uh, with video sales letters where we put somebody through a quiz, like a short quiz, five to seven questions. And then based on the answers, the first minute of the video sales letter that they saw after was different. So mm. it'd be like, oh, you're, you're weight loss type A and blah, that means blah, 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 blah. And it's all, you know, factual and tied to the studies. But then what happens is it makes like in the viewer's mind, it makes it feel like it's far more tailored of a solution. Right. Like, okay. So that, that ties into the ingredients X, Y, Z. So yeah, for sure. I love quizzes. I love surveys, polls, all that sort of stuff. They're great engagement devices for sure. This is so fascinating. We've got to have you come back. You know, it, sure. you're, 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 this is why I love marketing in the first place and, and just understanding most the general, you know, audience or the general public don't, don't know, you know, the psychology behind a lot of the the marketing and, and sometimes mm -hmm. it can get us in trouble too. I don't know. I, I you know, I'll go out to, with my wife to dinner and they go, you know why they're doing that, right? You know, <laughs> oh, for sure. I do that for all sure. the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, it's hard for me to go to a website and not see the banner <laughs> ads first. That's the first thing I see. I see ads first all the time. So oh man. Oh man. Yeah. Well, Chad, this is this has been great. If someone wants to reach out to you, perhaps uh, engage in your services, what's the best yeah. place to go to? Yeah, the best place is uh, my agency site. It's dsv2.com, uh, like David Sam Victor, the number two.com. I always have to put that out there. So yeah, dsv2.com, that's the best way. Get Reach me there with a form on the site. And uh, yeah, and you can learn a little bit more of what we do. I have to ask, are those your kids? Are those your college roommates? What are... Uh, it's, um, it's like a version two, the V2 of an old brand that I used to have. Oh, okay. And so that's essentially it. Yeah. <laughs> or the, maybe, I thought there were your opponents that you beat in the ring. Could have been that too. You know, nah, nah, nah. maybe, maybe I'll change it to something that's a little like, easier for people to, to mouth, you know, so <laughs> okay, we'll see. <laughs> well, Chad, thank you so much. There was so much that we could go through. I know we're just kind of scratching the surface, but it just got, gets us thinking about, you know, traffic. There's different ways to get traffic, but some of the best ways to get traffic is to use other people's lists, mm -hmm. use their use their notoriety, use their relationship with the audience so you can get traffic as well. So Absolutely. thanks everybody for listening. Thank you again, Chad. And as always, keep moving forward.